First things first, can you hear me way in the back there? Yes. Okay. In 1751, Doña Maria Gertrudez Sanchez met with the Commissario of the Holy Office of the Inquisition and denounced Barbara Garcia. Barbara Garcia and Doña Maria were both widows, Spanish, and from Sanchez, and from Sandia, which at that time was, um, had Spanish settlers. The denunciation was that Barbara Garcia was using sexual magic to enhance the attentions of a married man with whom she was in love. Commissario Pedro Montano questioned her, and she told him that she had told her friend, Caterina Gutierrez, widow of Spanish, Sandia, that she was in love with a married man. Caterina, uh, and this is according to the transcript, the Spanish transcript of the questioning by the Inquisition. This is what, um, uh, this, is, this is what Barbara Garcia had to say. She had told um, her friend about being in love. And Katerina, her friend, said, um, does the man love you? And Barbara said, yes, the man loves me very much. Katerina, do you want him to love you more? If you do, do the following. When you comb his hair, which seems to have been something you did with lovers, when you comb his hair, <laughs> take a few hair and tie them in your sash, and this will unite you more than before. Barbara, is this an evil act? Is it a sin? No, no, this is just to unite you more. So she did, she said, and the man did love her more, and he stopped having conjugal relations with his wife who Barbara says was a friend of hers. The wife complained to Barbara, and Barbara, again, speaking before the representative of the Inquisition, said uh, she would stop doing this, she burned the hair, she, and she returned to believing in God and would never do anything like that again and told the married man to go back to his wife, which he did and began to show his wife the love that he'd had before. Now, Commissario Montano, having found her repentant, dropped the case, and he made the comment of little substance, a superstition. I'll come back to um, Fry Montano later and also this case. Uh, uh, and you can see right here on the bottom line, let's see my little marker here. It says, denunciation against Barbara Garcia, um, speaking, and it, it's no substance, uh, a superstition. The reason I, um, I want to step aside here a minute and say it was documents, documents like this that interested me in the translations and transcriptions of Spanish colonial documents from the early and mid 18th century. Now I've lived in Santa Fe 30, going on 34 years, and I've took, taken countless Spanish class, classes, but my Spanish is still too limited to do this kind of thing. I, I was suggested, I work with Richard Salazar, who was known for land grant um, um, translations for land grant studies and Ezequiel documents, Ezequiel arguments. And in the end, uh, with the support of Jim Smith of Sunstone Press, in the end, we translated 54 documents and got, ended up with 650 pages. That's a lot more than we ever thought. We just, we kept coming on a different one. We've got to put that in, and we got kind of carried away. <laughs> so before I'd worked with these documents, I didn't have any much idea, rather, about the Inquisition in New Mexico. I'd heard uh, in, the, in the 1600s about the conflict between the governor and the Inquisition Franciscans, uh, governors being sent to the tribunal in Mexico City in chains and dying in a secret, uh, a secret prison in the, in the 1800s, 17th century, sorry, the 1700s, there was Abiquiu and the witch 
witchcraft trials and advocacy, with the in which the Inquisition um, entered reluctantly and late. But that is all I knew about it. So when I started dealing with these documents, I found much more. And I'd like to share with you three documents um, that, that show how the Inquisition here affected every day, the lives of every day and some of the more prestigious people in New Mexico. But first, some background on the Inquisition so we're all on the same page. It's sort of vegetables before dessert. So in, in 1469, Isabel of Castile and Fernando of Aragon, Ferdinand of Aragon were married in 1469, uniting the two crowns and technically uniting Spain. This is supposed to be her uh, painting at the time she was married. Later, Isabel, who was a very devout Catholic ruler and also worried about the precarious unity of the country, became concerned about heresy and in particular that of the Jewish conversos. So she asked the Pope for permission to establish an inquisition. Now there had been heresies before, the Albigensians and, and others. This was a little different because the crown, the Spanish crown, now that there was one, asked for permission for an inquisition. And in 17, sorry, six, wait a minute, 14, 78, let me get back there, the, the um, the anchor for this little discussion here is 1492, so all this is before that. So in 1478, the Pope gave the Spanish crown the authority to make appointments and the responsibility for funding the Inquisition, which in, in, fact, which in fact made the Inquisition a tool of the Spanish crown. There's the seal of the Inquisition. And you can see that it gave the, the monarchs of Spain a great deal of power, religious power and political power. The Inquisition was set up um, in 1480. That's the date you usually hear about the start of the Spanish Inquisition. There was a data bank that somebody put together in Spain. They took all the Inquisition cases and analyzed them and uh, when and where and who. And according to the data bank, the most virulent period of the Inquisition was 1480 to the 1520s. It certainly was strong and powerful after that, but that was when about 2,000 people were killed, 15,000 disciplined, and of course, many people left Spain. The, in the 1520s, because of that guy Luther, um, they also became concerned about others. So 1520 was opened up from the Jews, uh, heresies, Jewish heresies, and they um, also then concerned themselves with the Moriscos, the Lutherans, and this Alumbrados, who were Spanish mystics of some kind. The, 16, the 1600s, the 1500s and 1600s were the most active period. The data bank again shows that about 90% of the executions appeared in that period. Now the, let's see what the next one is. Now the Inquisition was not really a part of the New World conquest, but it didn't take very long. In 1516, the, the, the Inquisition powers were given to the bishops. There wasn't actually an organization for the Inquisition. It was given to the bishops and then in 1569, that's the date for the, the formal establishment of the Mexican Inquisition by uh, Philip II. And here he took away from the bishops their power uh, to investigate heresies and uh, immoral conduct. He had also already, uh, the, let me back up, the bishops had also um, already um, agreed to, I think not exactly being happy about it, that the friars who were not secular, uh, secular um, clergy, the friars could uh, um, hear confessions and excommunicate people. And the, the bishops never quite got over that. They, ne they didn't like it, and they were always edging, edging to send out the, get rid of the missions, put in the regular clergy, 
and take back some of the powers. And one of the backgrounds, the rumble rumbles in the back, is the viceroy and the governor versus the Inquisition versus, versus the bishops. And what is new to me and the Franciscans and the friars, that there was always this kind of balancing of power back and forth, and probably nobody except the Franciscans liked the Inquisition. This was the period, the um, 1500s and the 1600s were the period of the auto de fe in Mexico City. And here's one, let's see, and here's the poor accused. You can't probably see it. He has one of those dunce caps on, which were a sign. They were major, it was a holiday, major celebrations for this thing, for the auto de fe. There's a lot written about the Inquisition. And if you want to give yourself nightmares for a week, it's there for you to read. <laughs> so the organization, the organization um, in New Spain after 1569 included New Mexico. The Inquisition was headed by a tribunal. And that's the word that's scary, getting sent to the tribunal because they were like the judges. They were the ones with the secret um, prisons. At the district level, more to the point here, at the district level were the commissarios, the commissarios of the Holy Office of the Inquisition. The word ordinarily, in reading about this period, when you hear Holy Office, that means it was the Inquisition. And a point here that I didn't know was that the Inquisition in New Mexico, in the Custodia of St. Paul in New Mexico, uh, what it was called, were carried out by the Franciscans. The Franciscans were the troops for the Inquisition. They, uh, the head of the Inquisition, the Commissario, and the head of the Franciscans, the custodian, usually called the Custos, were ordinarily the same people. So you can see, let's get into the Franciscans, there's their banner, their insignia, their seal, and these are mostly from John, Book of John Kessel, by his permission. Um, there's a kindly looking friar, and there's a sarcastic picture of some friars. What's next? So, back up. Um, so, you can, again, you can see that this combination of the friars and the Inquisition gave uh, both a tremendous amount of power in the 1600s. They gave them the power to discipline the governors, and they did all through that period, and the governors often were on the losing side of, of the conflict between them. The, the, remember, both the Franciscans and the Inquisition were funded by the Spanish crown. The Franciscans had control of the caravans. They had access to Indian labor at the missions. They had money. They had manpower, and they were political power. In terms of a balance between them and the governors, it was kind of that with the, with the Inquisition Franciscans here and the governors down there. So after the conquest, things changed. Not everything changed, but some things changed. For one thing, the, um, the new Spain and Spain itself was under a new uh, ruler, under a new dynasty. The old... Um, uh, Habsburgs uh, died out. Uh, they were left without an heir. There was a big old war. There were a Spanish succession. And the new king was French. He was the grandson of Louis XIV, no less. There he is. Uh, with the new style of powdered hair. I'll talk about hair later, too. Um, and religious concerns were less of a priority than previous. In New Mexico, there was more concern for protecting the, uh, the frontiers and for protecting those important mines in Mexico than there was on saving souls. And also, overall, the Spanish Inquisition and the Mexican Inquisition had been very effective in eliminating the, the people they considered heretics. There weren't that many left. And so in this new period, what was different um, and one, one wants to say to give them something to do, but in the new period it was different, is they focused on minor heresies or minor crimes. And these minor heresies were bigamy, 
uh, blasphemous, disrespectful remarks, sexual promiscuity, bad behavior by the clergy, like solicitation in the confessional, and witchcraft. And witchcraft, from the, from the, in the very early days, 1400 to 1500, there was a lot of execution of witches, and some, some group of people, scholarly, Catholic, Inquisition people, got together, and, and it's, there's documents about it, and they said, no, this isn't where we want to go. We have other things. Witchcraft is not a, a major crime. It's superstition. It's folklore. It's ignorance. It's just not important. And you see that in that first document that I talked about where they said, Barbara Garcia, uh, of no importance. It's ignorance and superstition. Of course, the particular difference in New Mexico was the memory of the 1608 um, rebellion uh, and of the controversy between the Franciscans inquisitions and the governors and the feeling that that may have uh, led, to the, um, led to the revolt. But still, there were people that came back in 1680 that, that didn't quite understand this or didn't want to, or at least they certainly, Inquisition certainly came back. So in 1706, we have Friar Alvarez coming back to New Mexico. He's, he's a commissario, he's with the Inquisition. So the Inquisition is here in 1706. And leading up to the, the next document I want to talk about, his, his plan of action was to go out to the, all the um, colonists in New Mexico, the friars, or, I mean, the Indians were specifically exempt from the Inquisition. The Inquisition wasn't, and didn't touch the Indians. But there are the Spanish colonists and the mestizos um, were their concern. And so he went out proclaiming something that was called the Edict of Anathema or the Edict of Faith. And the, it, this proclamation was a regular part of the Inquisition. They'd been doing it since the beginning. We have records of it in New Mexico by 1616. So one of the documents that I wish to share with you is um, an example of an edict of faith read in Santa Fe in 1716. I couldn't find an actual edict, but I could find a discussion of it, and then I found an edict that... Um, was probably similar. So here is um, the plaza. This is a familiar map for most of you. Here's the presidio. Here's the church over here. And for the, this reading of anathema, reading of um, the Edict of Faith in 1716, there was a, a celebration, a parade, a procession. And we know about it because the notary for the Inquisition kept track of every little detail. And it may have been he just liked to do that, but I think more likely he was keeping track to show that the Inquisition was given proper respect. He was very concerned about, um, about um, protocol. So we have then, everybody got lined up at the convento, it was the Presidio, a bunch of the soldiers, followed by the Commissario from El Paso. He came up for the occasion. Um, the notary, they were escorted by the important, two important pieces, persons. The six or seven member Cabildo was marching along. And then in the end, the Commissario of the Inquisition and Governor Felix Martinez. And it says they, they took the usual route around the plaza. Well, what's that? Well, what did I do about finding out about that? I asked Dee Dee Snow is the person most likely to know all about it. And she, whoops, and she said that they probably started here in their procession and they went across the river and they went down, trooped down Barrio de Analco and what happened to it? And came up here and then trooped around the plaza again, ending at the cathedral. And nobody got into an argument. They all seemed to have gotten along. And I, and I feel like after they managed to do all that, everything properly done, 
that maybe they went over to the palace or the convento and you know, had a little glass of something and congratulated themselves for doing it so well. But I made that up. I don't know if it happened. The Edict of Faith that they read, um, was, we have the words proclaiming it. We just don't have the exact edict. The pro proclamation initiating that was the edict is being read so that everyone can see the fearsome and affectionate ceremonies of the Holy Mother Church and, of course, the Holy Office. And I'd like to read from you a bit from the uh, from an edict from someplace else, but from about the same time. And this is an edict of faith for diverse heresies, for, in other words, the minor heresies. And here it is. If anyone has said they do not believe in paradise or glory for the good, nor hell for the bad, or if anyone has heard someone make blasphemous statements against God, or somebody has invoked the devil, if somebody has been a witch or a wizard or knows of one, if anybody knows of a cleric or friar who has solicited women in the confessional, if anybody knows of somebody who has com committed bigamy, that goes on and on with several other things. And then it says, if this is the anathema part, if anyone knows a person who has done these things with her father, mother, family, if anybody knows a person who has done these things and they do not come forward to denounce that person, then they are excommunicated and may not be dissolved by a confessor. In other words, after death, they are doomed. So then after, the, after this was read, um, the Edict of Anathema to all the people that had been requested to come from the surrounding area. A regular mass was, high mass was held, and everybody went back to the, um, as I said, everybody went back to the, to the uh, church or the palace. The edict, reading of an edict, edict of Anathema, Edict of Faith and Anathema, was a standard, regular uh, part of the um, technique of the Inquisition. And some places it was read once a year. Certainly it was read regularly. We know it was read in New Mexico in 1616, and we know it was read later in the later 1700s. And it seems to me that the reading of this, it's a divisive kind of document. You're supposed to tell on your neighbor. And I think this, uh, the Barbara Garcia and the person who told on her was an example of that. Because after the edict, there would be these rush of denouncements from people that were um, intimidated by the, the reading of the edict. The edict, I don't know about you, but the edict intimidated me, for sure, in just reading about it. But going on to the second document, let's see what we got here. Um, a second document, one person who was not intimidated and showed it was Governor Juan Domingo Bustamante. Again, we don't know what he looks like. There's his signature with the and here. Uh, that's not heaven's knows, it's a it's a drawing by Cisneros of an 18th century soldier. And he might have looked like that. That Cisneros did. Uh, research what, what the um, people wore in his drawing, so at least um, the outfit is probably pretty close. Governor Bustamante was governor for quite some time, 1722 to 1731. He was a military man. He was um, a lieutenant governor of El Paso, and he seems to have been a cocky, outspoken, pride, uh, proud, probably arrogant, um, maybe obnoxious sort of person. And reading about him as governor, he seems to have raised the level of discord and acrimony between the friars and the governor and the Inquisition and the governor several degrees all by himself. And it's sort of a relief to talk about him. So here's the second document. What's the next one? Here's the second document. What happened was the commissario 
or the soon to be commissario of the Inquisition and Governor Bustamante got into an argument at the church door um, prior, just prior, minutes prior to the, re the procession for the Corpus Christi celebration. What we know about it was written by uh, Governor Bustamante. I think he was just covering himself and he wrote everything down. We don't know the other side, so you have to understand that. So here we are the night before the procession and the celebration and the, and the high mass. And I should explain about Corpus Christi first. Corpus Christi, and some of you have probably been to Corpus Christi celebrations in Peru or maybe Spain or elsewhere. It's a, major, um, it's a major celebration of the church, and it consists of, in addition to other things, it consists of a parade around a certain area, and people have set up altars on the parade. The, the, the prelate, the, the highest and most important person in the church, carries the, this receptacle called a monstrance, the celebration is, in, is in, as its name is, Body of Christ, is in commemoration of the, the presence, here's some theology, the presence of Christ appearing in the host, appearing in the bread and wine. Um, and it, the bread becomes the body of Christ. It turned, transubstantiation, it becomes the body of Christ and is therefore very holy, the holy host. And that holy host is put in the monstrance, carried around as a very holy item, and the, the person who carries it or the person who is near it um, gains by uh, participating. So that's what's happening. Um, and all the people who are coming in town, the Indians are there, and all the people from all over, and they're hanging around, so naturally they, they notice anything that happens at the front door of the church. The, it's the night before the procession, and Bustamante, he's been here for years, they've done this several times. He goes over to meet uh, commissario, well, to be commissario, but Fry um, Juan Antonio Guerrero. And Guerrero isn't there. He stands him up, he sends two clerics, and Bustamante is embarrassed, and he decides to be offended. So um, he goes, the next day is a major church, is the major procession, and Fry Guerrero goes out in front of the church. He's ready to join in the procession, and he's carrying the monstrance, the holies of holies, and Bustamante doesn't show up. And not only that, part of the procession, the soldierly part of the procession, which has to do with shooting off guns and, and raising the flag up and down and, and marching in formation, that has already started. Oh, oh. So um, he sends a message over to the palace. And Bustamante says, well, I didn't want to start a scene, so I went over to talk to them. So here they are, standing in, and, and previous to this, um, Bustamante says to one of, of uh, Bustamante's officials, I mean, Guevara says to one of Bustamante's officials, he said, if he wants to be disrespectful, I'll show him disrespect, which doesn't bode well for their upcoming conversation. So Guevara sends the friars over to get Bustamante. He comes over and he meets the governor at the front of the church. Everybody, of course, naturally is watching this because it's not usual and it's more interesting than just standing around, probably. So they're at the front door of the church. He's, Guerrero's carrying the monstrance. He's getting ready to go out. And, and he insists that the procession, what's done is be done again, and that Bustamante join in, as is the regular case. And, and Bustamante says, it's not up to you. I'm not going to, it, it's not up to you to decide where the soldiers will be. They, they follow orders, and I've given them to them. Guevara says, you can sort of see him leaning forward kind of, do you recognize me as an ecclesiastical judge? Which in a way is a threat, because he's up to be the commissario, and he gets to act like the judge in that case. And Bustamante, there's sort of toe-to-toe -to -toe kind of thing. Bustamante says, do you recognize me as the governor and captain general? And it seems to me right there that 
it, it just says it all. The church versus the state and, and the governors and the balance back and forth between them. So, according to Bustamante, Guevara goes into the church carrying the, the host, the monstrance, and, and it's all different. It's not the way it's supposed to happen, and here's this guy carrying this holy object around, and people, according to Bustamante, there's this scene. People shout, the women cry out, you know, what is happening? We don't know what happens next, but we do know that there was a procession, and they did march around, and Bustamante says, I, didn't, I said I wasn't going to go, and I did not go. He also wrote, um, he also wrote all about it in, in the, the document from which I, he wrote about it himself, and he had two of his assistants, two officials, one the Akaldi and another official, also write about it. And they could not, they, I think they had a good time, or at least it's fun to read the document, they could not say enough good about the document. They said, it was, it was the best one we've ever seen, it was the most irreverent we've ever seen, it was outstanding in its sublimity, uh, the soldier formation was perfect, there wasn't a slight, slightest hitch. The governor's altar was both brilliant and elegant. He had brocade hangings, he had the altar, he had perfumed candles of different odors. And you feel like they had a good time doing it, as I said. On the other hand, of course, the friars in the Inquisition were furious. You can imagine how upset they were. They, named, they, called, they called him names, they made charges against him. According to John Kessel, they said he is an ogre. He's an irreverent ogre without one single redeeming grace. And they, they threw the book at him, everything they could think of. Now, what's interesting about that, and it shows you a change is that there was no um, there was no uh, denouncement. They did not denounce Bustamante to the tribunal in Mexico City. He was not hauled down there in chains and kept in a prison, a private cell, a private secret cell. They, in fact, the charges were sent to a official of the a viceroy, who, of course was probably going to be on the governor's side, and in fact was, that Bustamante got off with, with essentially a slap on the wrist. And historians say that this really was a change when the balance between the governor and then the Inquisition tips on the side of the governors. Here, I'll take a drink of water. The next and third document Appears, um, occurs about um, five years later. And it's about Fray Pedro Montano. Remember him? He's the one about 20 years later that uh, questioned Barbara Garcia. Now, some people, uh, there, there seems to have been a weakening in the, the Inquisition activity and the friars, but not everybody got the message, and in particular, Fray Pedro Montano acted in the same high-handed way that the Inquisition always had. He was, he was known to be strict. Let's go to the next one. Even though the, the people said Bustamante was a reverend and an ogre and everything, he did build the church all on his own without money from other places at Nam Bay. And when the uh, church fell down in the early 20th century, um, Gerald Cassidy, one of the Cinco Pintores, the early uh, Santa Fe painters, took the beams and put, him in, put them in his house. And one of the beams says, I built the church, Bustamante. Oops, darn it, I'm going to go back. There he is. You can kind of see they ran out of room, kind of. Bustamante, kind of boosted <laughs> off to the side there. And so, in a way, um, his name lives among us, and, and um, Fry Guerrero does not. So, but going to the next document of um, Pedro Montano, 1733, um, Pedro Montano, this is Albuquerque, Pedro Montano was a priest there, um, one of those priests, that, uh, friars that acted like a priest. He was holding a mass for the dead, 
dressed in his own vestments, and uh, dressed in his special vestments, and 20-year-old Pedro Garcia Jarado arrived a little bit late with his hair in braids, and he wasn't wearing his cloak. Now, um, uh, Fry Montano was known as being a stickler for behaving. For he, it was very important him, for him to be respectful. On the other hand, Pedro Garcia was the grandson of Martin um, Hurtado, Hurtado, who was a founding father of Albuquerque. He was the first alcalde. He laid out some of the lots. He um, he was the head of the first garrison, so he was an important, respected person. So anyway, here's, here's Pedro, the grandson, um, and he comes in, in with his hair not correctly done, and the priest says, unbraid your hair, uh, let's see, unbraid your hair. There are those who are ignorant of the law and will say that it's fine if you don't unbraid, go to church and you don't unbraid your hair, and Pedro apparently didn't know what to say, didn't say anything, so Montano called him aside and he said, unbraid your hair, son, what's it cost you to do it? Uh, Pedro Garcia said, well, um, I'm poor, I don't have any money to have somebody comb it out, which seems odd, but anyway, have it somebody, this thing about hair, have somebody comb, comb it out, and anyway, after mass, I'm going to burn a leo. Now at this point, uh, the grandfather, Martin Hurtado, steps in and says to his grandson, leave, go outside and braid your hair and then come back in. So Pedro um, Garcia starts to leave and Montano says, wait a minute, why are you leaving? And braid your hair. And again, the grandson doesn't know what to say, he's silent. And Montano says, I will write to the governor of your disrespect, and I claim everybody here in the church as witness, all the other people, all the other parishioners from Albuquerque. And Hurtado, who's used to probably working with Bustamante and used to being close to the governor, says, what's he going to do, the governor? Montano says, I will write and make sure he does something, and if he's not a witness, if he's not a Christian, um, and he's not a Christian, if he does not punish this behavior. And Hurtado, this is another toe-to-toe -to -toe thing, you know. And her, her, Martin Hurtado says, go ahead, I'll be a witness, and I'll carry the letter to the governor. Montano says, you will not. Oh, so Montano then carries on with mass, and Martin Hurtado, I think, has second thoughts. So after the mass, he goes to the priest, and he gets down on his knees, and he begs forgiveness. And Montano says, no. So the next day, Martin Hurtado, after Mass, he goes and he does it again. He announces his sin to the whole congregation, gets down on his knees and asks for forgiveness. And Pedro Garcia was there along with him. And the priest says, yes, you are forgiven. And by the way, if there is anything suggested excommunication, you're absolved. You're not, I didn't really say that. So you think the story there is done that there's no more, um, but there is, and that's what's strange about it, because Fray Montano then writes to the commissario, who is now Juan Antonio Guevara, right, from the last document. And Juan Antonio Guevara, he's now commit commissario of the Inquisition and also um, a head of the Franciscans, and he writes a letter to the governor, Cruzat y Gangora, he's fairly new, and he asks him to investigate this. He wants it investigated, and he wants witness calls, and he wants Martin Hurtado, because he was the elder, he wants him punished, he says. But he says, I do not want loss of blood. Punishing, I do not want loss of blood or mutilation of joints. You say, oh, good. <laughs> and you think, aha, that's how these Inquisition guys think. I don't know. So the Alcalde, Juan Gonzalez Bas, who's kind of well known, at least among people from Albuquerque, Juan Gonzalez Bas puts Hurtado and Garcia in, in the, um, well, in prison, but it was probably the guardhouse of the garrison. Hurtado says, I'm an old man, which he was. He was probably, you know, for that time, um, 60 or something. And he says, um, I'm an old man, I'm not well. Do I really have to stay in the guardhouse? And, and, 
Gonzalez boss, you know, probably knew him, heavens knows they were probably related in some way. And he says, well, no, you don't. Well, then uh, Fry Montano hears about that. I got it zip along there. He hears about that, and he writes this very angry letter. And here's the letter. You can see his name at the bottom. Point, yeah, there's the bottom. And he wrote the letter himself. And here's uh, a summary of what it says. He says, he writes it to the Acalde, and he says, I want Martin Hurtado placed in a dungeon where he cannot see the sun or the moon. I want him placed in shackles, you know, leg irons. I want him locked in uh, stocks so he can't communicate with anybody and he can't escape. Well, so um, Gonzalez Boss apparently does put him back in prison. He then holds, uh, um, he interviews eight witnesses. Everything is in the Spanish way is written down, which is why we have all these interesting documents. He sends it to the governor, Cruzati Gangor. Cruzati Gangor sends it to uh, Fray Juan Antonio Guerrero, the commissary of the Holy Inquisition. And Guerrero doesn't do anything. That's what's interesting. They didn't send it to the a tribunal, they didn't, they didn't do anything. Which, again, gives you a clue about the status, the balance between the church and the governor. The, um, let's see, going, uh, the, it must have damaged uh, Martin Hurtado, or maybe he was really that sick, he does die 18 months later. Now that's the end of the third document, but there's a postscript about Fry Montano. Because, as you know, he appears again in the um, 1751 with the questioning of Barbara Garcia. That's the very first one. By this time, he is the commissary of the Holy Inquisition. And that, it has lost, the Inquisition has lost stature, it's lost prestige, and as often the case, the friars turn on each other and there was a, a real um, kind of mudslinging among the friars at this time with Montano accusing his sort of um, competition from El Paso of having illegitimate children and solicitating women in the confessional, and they accuse him of, of um, having affairs with a lot of children, and there's this really weird thing about somebody paying a cook at, at the um, convento to poison the stew, and it's just, it's just a big ruckus. And when the ruckus ends, the worm has turned because Montano is um, sent back to Mexico City. He loses, he's sent back to Mexico City and um, probably retires. Now that gets us up to the mid-18th century, which, which is as far as I um, have studied this, and just a postscript uh, about what happened to the Franciscans and the Inquisition after that. The Inquisition stayed in, with, there was a decline, although sometimes there'd still be arguments with the governors, there is the decline. The Inquisition stayed in Mexico City until 1820, uh, Mexican independence. It ended after that, at least for the reason that um, it was funded by the king of Spain, and when you're independent, you don't get money from the king anymore. So it ended there. Though, of course, the Franciscans go on. Um, we still have Franciscans today, though they aren't a straight line from the Spanish. They're American, a uh, different line, American Franciscans. In Spain, um, again, the Inquisition goes on, but with less power. There's kind of a hiatus when Napoleon conquers Spain, where it, the Inquisition has very little power, and then it comes back. Even though it has less power, it has enough. Um, it has enough terrible things happen to excite the imagination of one Francisco Goya, who um, probably some of you saw his horrific drawings at the um, Albuquerque Museum um, about a year or so ago about a year ago. So uh, he was horrified by the Inquisition, certainly, and other art historians also say, well, he was using lead white paint and he was, you know, he was kind of half crazy because of lead poisoning. So there was also that. But in 1834, 
the Inquisition finally was abolished. Thank you. <laughs>